Hello, fifth grade. We are going to continue with wonder. We are still in Augie's section. We are on page 220, and we are reading through page 234. So in the last section, um, Augie is starting to make friends with other classmates. Julian's friends are kind of distancing themselves from him a bit. Um, though Julian is still kind of leaving notes and saying mean things to Jack and Augie. At the end of our last video, however, um, Isabel, Augie's mom, found out that Via hadn't told her and Nate, their dad, um, about the play. And so Isabel was hurt by that, that Via wouldn't tell her, and Via you know, in an angry moment, basically said to her mom, you've done a really good job of ignoring me my whole life. Why are you suddenly so interested now that I'm in high school? And that really hurt um, Via and Augie's mom for Via to say that to her. So they got into a big fight and then they were at the dinner table and Isabel was saying to Augie, actually, Augie, I didn't realize what the play was about. You wouldn't like it anyway. And Augie thinks that Via doesn't want him there because of how he looks and he stormed off to his room and he was waiting for someone to come find him because they felt guilty and he was really upset. But at the end, Via came quickly into his room and that's where we left off. All right, page 220, goodbye. Augie, said Via, come quick, mom needs to talk to you. I'm not apologizing. This isn't about you, she yelled. Not everything in the world is about you, Augie. Now hurry up. Daisy's sick. Mom's taking her to the emergency vet. Come say goodbye. I pushed the pillows off my face and looked up at her. That's when I saw she was crying. What do you mean goodbye? Come on, she said, holding out her hand. I took her hand and followed her down the hall to the kitchen. Daisy was lying down sideways on the floor with her legs straight out in front of her. She was panting a lot, like she'd been running in the park. Mom was kneeling beside her, stroking the top of her head. What happened? I asked. She just started whimpering all of a sudden, said Via, kneeling down next to Mom. I looked down at Mom, who was crying too. I'm taking her to the animal hospital downtown, she said. The taxi's coming to pick me up. The vet'll make her better, right? I said. Mom looked at me. I hope so, honey, she said quietly, but I honestly don't know. Of course he will, I said. Daisy's been sick a lot, Augie, and she's old. But they can fix her, I said, looking at Via to agree with me. But Via wouldn't look up at me. Mom's lips were trembling. I think it might be time we say goodbye to Daisy, Augie. I'm sorry. No, I said. We don't want her to suffer, Augie, she said. The phone rang. Via picked it up, said, okay, thanks, and then hung up. The taxi's outside, she said, wiping her tears with the backs of her hands. Okay, Augie, open the door for me, sweetie, said Mom, picking Daisy up very gently like she was a huge, droopy baby. Please, no, Mommy, I cried, putting myself in front of the door. Honey, please, said Mom. She's very heavy. What about Daddy, I cried. He's meeting me at the hospital, Mom said. He doesn't want Daisy to suffer, Augie. Via moved me away from the door and held it open for Mom. My cell phone's on if you need anything, Mom said to Via. Can you cover her with the blanket? Via nodded, but she was crying hysterically now. Say goodbye to Daisy, kids, Mom said, tears streaming down her face. I love you, Daisy, Via said, kissing Daisy on the nose. I love you so much. Bye, little girlie, I whispered into Daisy's ear. I love you. Mom carried Daisy down the stoop. The taxi driver had opened the back door and we had watched her get in. Just before she closed the door, Mom looked up at us standing by the entrance to the building, and she gave us a little wave. I don't think I've ever seen her look sadder. I love you, Mommy, said Via. I love you, Mommy, I said. I'm sorry, Mommy. Mom blew a, a kiss to us and closed the door. We watched the car leave, and then Via closed the door. She looked at me a second, and then she hugged me very, very tight while we both cried a million tears. Now, fifth grade, if any of you have ever had a pet suddenly get sick, you know how scary it can be. Um, you know, I've had, let's see, Benny is the fourth Cocker Spaniel that we've had. And I remember with each of our, our past dogs, 
you know, as they were growing up, sometimes it gets sick and we get scared. And it's especially scary when your, your animal, your pet is older because you know that eventually there's going to be one sickness that they get that they just, you know, they're not going to recover from. You'll, you bring them to the vet and they'll tell you, you know, that it's cancer or it's something else. And they'll say, you know, they're in pain. And so then it's your decision as the caregiver, you know, to, um, you know, take them away from that pain. And so, um, Augie and V are worried that it's that kind of an illness. You know, it's that last illness that a pet gets before they pass away and go to God's kingdom. So we're going to keep reading and find out if that's what this is. Daisy's Toys. Justin came over about half an hour later. He gave me a big hug and said, sorry, Augie. We all sat down in the living room, not saying anything. For some reason, Via and I had taken all of Daisy's toys from around the house and had put them in a little pile on the coffee table. Now we just stared at the pile. She really is the greatest dog in the world, said Via. I know, said Justin, rubbing Via's back. She just started whimpering like all of a sudden, I said. Via nodded. Like two seconds after you left the table, she said, Mama's going to go after you, but Daisy just started, like, whimpering. Like how, I said. Just whimpering, I don't know, said Via. Like howling, I asked. Augie, like whimpering, she answered impatiently. She just started moaning, like something was really hurting her, and she was panting like crazy. Then she just kind of plopped down, and Mom went over and tried to pick her up and whatever. She was obviously hurting. She bit Mom. What, I said. When Mom tried to touch her stomach, Daisy bit her hand, Via explained. Daisy never bites anybody, I answered. She wasn't herself, said Justin. She was obviously in pain. Daddy was right, said Via. We shouldn't have let her get this bad. What do you mean, I said. He knew she was sick? Augie, Mom's taken her to the vet like three times in the last two months. She's been throwing up left and right. Haven't you noticed? But I didn't know she was sick. Via didn't say anything, but she put her arm around my shoulders and pulled me closer to her. I started to cry again. I'm sorry, Augie, she said softly. I'm really sorry about everything, okay? You forgive me? You know how much I love you, right? I nodded. Somehow that fight didn't matter much now. Was Mommy bleeding, I asked. It was just a nip, said Via, right there. She pointed to the bottom of her thumb to show me exactly where Daisy had bitten Mom. Did it hurt her? Mommy's okay, Augie. She's fine. Mom and Dad came home two hours later. We knew the second they opened the door, and Daisy wasn't with them, that Daisy was gone. We all sat down in the living room around the pile of Daisy's toys. Dad told us what happened at the animal hospital, how the vet took Daisy for some x-rays and blood tests, then came back and told them she had a huge mass in her stomach. She was having trouble breathing. Mom and Dad didn't want her to suffer, so Daddy picked her up in his arms like he always liked to do, with her legs straight out, straight up in the air, and he and Mom kissed her goodbye over and over again and whispered to her while the vet put a needle into her leg, and then after about a minute, she died in Daddy's arms. It was so peaceful, Daddy said. She wasn't in any pain at all, like she was just going to sleep. A couple of times while he talked, Dad's voice got trembly and he cleared his throat. I'd never seen Dad cry before, but I saw him cry tonight. I had gone into Mom and Dad's bedroom looking for Mom to put me to bed, but saw Dad sitting on the edge of the bed taking off his socks. His back was to the door, so he didn't know I was there. At first, I thought he was laughing because his shoulders were shaking, but then he put his palms on his eyes and I realized he was crying. It was the quietest crying I've ever heard, like a whisper. I was going to go over to him, but then I thought maybe he was whisper crying because he didn't want me or anyone else to hear him. So I walked out and went to Via's room, and I saw Mom lying next to Via on the bed, and Mom was whispering to Via, who was crying. So I went to my bed and put on my pajamas without anyone telling me to, and put the nightlight on and turned the light off and crawled into the little mountain of stuffed animals that I had left on my bed earlier. It felt like that all had happened a million years ago. I took my hearing aids off and put them on the night table and pulled the covers up to my ears and imagined Daisy snuggling with me, her big wet tongue licking my face all over like it was her favorite face in the world. 
and that's how I fell asleep. Well, fifth grade, unfortunately, Daisy passed away. Um, it's hard losing an, a pet, losing an animal. And those of you who've had a pet, you in who uh, those of you have had a pet that has passed away, you know that. And so I feel like sometimes that first night, it's almost surreal. You know, um, I, I've remembered with, like I said, my past dogs, you know, the first night you're, you're so sad and you, but you wake up and it, for a couple moments in the morning, you don't realize, you know, you think everything's okay. And then suddenly it hits you again that you're going to walk out of your bedroom door and that little face that's usually there isn't going to be there for you that day. But then, and that can fill you with a lot of pain and a lot of sadness, but then you think about the fact that, you know, your, your friend, your buddy, your pal, your pet was in pain. They were suffering and you didn't completely know that. And so then you think about the fact that they've passed on into God's kingdom. And now they have, if it's a dog, they have fields upon fields of green grass to run through. They have as many treats as they want. They have other dogs to play with. If you've had any other family members that have passed away, they're up there taking care of your pet. And it's just it's a really comforting thought to think that they are in such a beautiful place doing everything that dogs should do, be able to do all day, every day. And you know that you get to see them again. So I hope that Augie, Via, Augie and Via can keep that in mind. Heaven. I woke up later on and it was still dark. I got out of bed and walked into mom and dad's bedroom. Mommy, I whispered. It was completely dark, so I couldn't see her open her eyes. Mommy, you okay, honey? She said groggily. Can I sleep with you? Mom scooted over toward daddy's side of the bed, and I snuggled up next to her. She kissed my hair. Is your hand okay, I said. Via told me Daisy bit you. It was only a nip, she whispered in my ear. Mommy, I started crying. I'm sorry about what I said. Shh, there's nothing to be sorry about, she said. <clears throat> so quietly I could barely hear her. She was rubbing the side of her face against my face. Is Via ashamed of me, I said. No, honey, no, you know she's not. She's just adjusting to a new school. It's not easy. I know. I know you know. I'm sorry I called you a liar. Go to sleep, sweet boy. I love you so much. I love you so much too, Mommy. Good night, honey, she said very softly. Mommy, is Daisy with Grands now? I think so. Are they in heaven? Yes. Do people look the same when they get to heaven? I don't know. I don't think so. Then how do people recognize each other? I don't know, sweetie. She sounded tired. They just feel it. You don't need your eyes to love, right? You just feel it inside of you. That's how it is in heaven. It's just love, and no one forgets who they love. She kissed me again. Now go to sleep, honey. It's late, and I'm so tired. But I couldn't go to sleep. Even after I knew she had fallen asleep, I could hear Daddy sleeping, too, and I imagined I could hear Via sleeping down the hallway in her room. And I wondered if Daisy was sleeping in heaven right then. And if she was sleeping, was she dreaming about me? And I wondered how it would feel to be in heaven someday and not have my face matter anymore just like it never, ever mattered to Daisy. Now, fifth grade, obviously losing Daisy is hard for everyone in the Pullman family. But as Aki has mentioned a few times, and Via mentioned this in her chapters too, Daisy, you know, was the one, the one character in the book, or the one person, one being in their life who never treated Aki any differently from anyone else. Because, you know, Daisy was a dog. She loved her people. She didn't care what they looked like. She treated them all the same and loved them all the same. Now Augie has lost that. You know, he could always rely on Daisy to treat him just like everyone else. Love him just like everybody else. And now he doesn't have that. 
Do you think that's going to end up affecting him as we go throughout the book? Maybe. Let's keep reading. Understudy. Via brought home three tickets to her school play a few days after Daisy died. We never mentioned the fight we had over dinner again. On the night of the play, right before she and Justin were leaving to get to their school early, she gave me a big hug and told me she loved me, and she was proud to be my sister. This was my first time in Via's new school. It was much bigger than her old school and a thousand times bigger than my school. More hallways, more room for people. The only really bad thing about my bionic lobot hearing aids was the fact that I couldn't wear a baseball cap anymore. In situations like these, baseball caps come in really handy. Sometimes I wish I could still get away with wearing that old astronaut helmet I used to wear when I was little. Believe it or not, people would think seeing a kid in an astronaut helmet was a lot less weird than seeing my face. Anyway, I kept my head down as I walked right behind Mom through the long, bright hallways. We followed the crowd to the auditorium where students handed out programs at the front entrance. We found seats in the fifth row close to the middle. As soon as we sat down, Mom started looking inside her pocketbook. I can't believe I forgot my glasses, she said. Dad shook his head. Mom was always forgetting her glasses or her keys or something or other. She's flaky that way. You want to move closer, said Dad. Mom squinted at the stage. No, I can see okay. Speak now or forever hold your peace, said Dad. I'm fine, answered Mom. Look, there's Justin, I said to Dad, pointing out Justin's picture in the program. That's a nice picture of him, he answered, nodding. How come there's no picture of Via, I said. She's an understudy, said Mom. But look, here's her name. Why do they call her an, an understudy, I asked. Wow, look at Miranda's picture, said Mom to Dad. I don't think I would have recognized her. Why do they call it an call it understudy, I repeated. It's what they call someone who pre replaces an actor if he can't perform for some reason, answered Mom. Did you hear Martin's getting remarried, Dad said to Mom. Are you kidding me? Mom answered like she was surprised. Who's Martin, I asked. Miranda's father, Mom answered, and then to Dad. Who told you? I ran into Miranda's mother in the subway. She's not happy about it. He has a new baby on the way and everything. Wow, said Mom, shaking her head. What are you guys talking about, I said. Nothing, answered Dad. But why do they call it understudy, I said. I don't know, Aggie Doggy, Dad answered. Maybe because the actors kind of study under the main actors or something? I really don't know. I was going to say something else, but then the lights went down. The audience got very quiet very quickly. Daddy, can you please not call me Augie Doggy anymore? I whispered in Dad's ear. Dad smiled and nodded and gave me a thumbs up. The play started, the curtain opened. The stage was completely empty except for Justin, who was sitting on an old rickety chair tuning his fiddle. He was wearing an old-fashioned type of suit and a straw hat. This play is called Our Town, he said to the audience. It was written by Thornton Wilder, produced and directed by Philip Davenport. The name of the town is Grover's Corners, New Hampshire, just across the Massachusetts line. Latitude 42 degrees 40 minutes, longitude 70 degrees 37 minutes. The first act shows a day in our town. The day is May 7th, 1901. The time is just before dawn. I knew right then and there that I was going to like the play. It wasn't like other school plays I've been to, like The Wizard of Oz or Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. No, this was a grown up, this was grown up seeming, and I felt smart sitting there watching it. A little later in the play, a character named Mrs. Webb calls out for her daughter Emily. I knew from the program that that was the part Miranda was playing, so I leaned forward to get a better look at her. That's Miranda, Mom whispered to me, squinting at the stage when Emily walked out. She looks so different. It's not Miranda, I whispered. It's Via. Oh my God, said Mom, lurching forward in her seat. Shh, said Dad. It's Via, Mom whispered to him. I know, whispered Dad, smiling. Shh. The ending. The play was so amazing. I don't want to give away the ending, but it's the kind of ending that makes people in the audience teary. Mom total, totally lost it when Via, as Emily, said, Goodbye, goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corners, Mama and Papa. Goodbye to Clucks Ticking and Mama's Sunflowers, and food and coffee, and new iron dresses and hot baths, and sleeping and waking up. 
Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anybody to realize you. Via was actually crying while she was saying this, like real tears. I could see them rolling down her cheeks. It was totally awesome. After the curtain closed, everyone in the audience started clapping. Then the actors came out one by one. Via and Justin were the last ones out, and when they appeared, the whole audience rose to their feet. Bravo, I heard Dad yelling through his hands. Why is everyone getting up, I said. It's a standing ovation, said Mom, getting up. And so I got up and clapped and clapped. I clapped until my hands hurt. For a second, I imagined how cool it would be to be Via and Justin right then, having all these people standing up and cheering for them. I think there should be a rule that everyone in the world should get a standing ovation at least once in their lives. Finally, after I don't know how many minutes, the line of actors on stage stepped back and the curtain closed in front of them. The clapping stopped and the lights went up and the audience started getting up to leave. Me and mom and dad, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> me and mom and dad made our way to the backstage. Crowds of people were congratulating the performers, surrounding them, patting them on the back. We saw Via and Justin at the center of the crowd, smiling at everyone, laughing and talking. Via, shouted dad, waving as he made his way through the crowd. When he got close enough, he hugged her and lifted her off the floor a little. You were amazing, sweetheart. Oh my God, Via, mom was screaming with excitement. Oh my God, oh my God. She was hugging Via so hard, I thought Via would suffocate, but Via was laughing. You were brilliant, said dad. Brilliant, said mom, kind of nodding and shaking her head at the same time. And you, Justin, said dad, shaking Justin's hand and giving him a hug at the same time. You were fantastic. Fantastic, mom repeated. She was honestly so emotional, she could barely talk. What a shock to see you up there, Via, said dad. Mom didn't even recognize you at first, I said. I didn't recognize you, said mom, her hand over her mouth. Miranda got sick right before the show started, said Via, all out of breath. There wasn't even time to make an announcement. I have to say, she looked kind of strange because she was wearing all this makeup and I'd never seen her like this before. And you just stepped in there right at the last minute, said Dad. Wow. She was amazing, wasn't she, said Justin, his arm around Via. There wasn't a dry eye in the house, said Dad. Is Miranda okay, I said, but no one heard me. That moment, a man who I think was their teacher came over to Justin and Via, clapping his hands. Bravo, bravo, Olivia and Justin. He kissed Via on both cheeks. I flubbed a couple of lines, said Via, shaking her head. But you got through it, said the man, smiling ear to ear. Mr. Davenport, these are my parents, said Via. You must be so proud of your girl, he said, shaking their hands with both his hands. We are. This is my little brother, August, said Via. He looked like he was about to say something, but suddenly froze when he looked at me. Mr. D, said Justin, pulling him by the arm. Come meet my mom. Via was about to say something to me, but then someone else came over and started talking to her. Before I knew it, I was kind of alone in the crowd. I mean, I knew where mom and dad were, but there were so many people around us, and people kept bumping into me, spinning me around a bit, giving me that one-two look, which made me feel kind of bad. I don't know if it was because I was feeling hot or something, but I kind of started getting dizzy. People's faces were blurring in my head, and their voices were so loud it was almost hurting my ears. I tried to turn the volume down on my lobot ears, but I got confused and turned them louder at first, which kind of shocked me. And then I looked up, and I didn't see Mom or Dad or Via anywhere. Via? I yelled out. I started pushing through the crowd to find Mom. Mommy? I really couldn't see anything but people's stomachs and ties all around me. Mommy! Suddenly, someone picked me up from behind. Look who's here, said a familiar voice, hugging me tight. I thought it was Via at first, but when I turned around, I was completely surprised. Hey, Major Tom, she said. Miranda, I answered, and I gave her the tightest hug I could give. And we're going to stop there, fifth grade. Now, as you can see, the next part, part seven, is from Miranda's perspective. Do you think we're going to get some answers about why Miranda's been acting so differently towards Via this year? Yeah, we probably are. And like what's been happening quite a few times in this book, do you think we will be able to kind of put ourselves in Miranda's shoes, empathize with her, and maybe understand a little bit why she's acting so differently? Probably. Because I think, and I think you guys have noticed this, when you're in the thoughts of someone else and you 
see and feel everything that they're seeing and feeling, it's a lot easier to understand them, isn't it? And it's harder to be completely upset with them, isn't it? It really is. And that's what we call empathizing, being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and maybe not agree with what they're doing, but you can understand why they're doing it. Nice job today, fifth grade.